how many people do you work with that you don't see today or most any day? Today, we're going to talk about connecting better in a virtual world. Are you ready? Welcome to episode 130 of the Remarkable Leadership Podcast. Welcome to the Remarkable Leadership Podcast. We are here each week to talk about leadership, teamwork, organizational culture, and human potential with experts from every walk of life. Your host is Kevin Eikenberry, a best-selling author and leadership thought leader for 25 years. This episode is sponsored by Kevin's book, The Long Distance Leader, Rules for Remarkable Remote Leadership. Order your copy today at remarkablepodcast.com forward slash book. And now, here's your host, Kevin. Hey, everybody. Welcome to the Remarkable Leadership Podcast. Our guest today is Nick Morgan. Let me tell you about Nick, and then we'll dive in. He's got a brand new book. We're going to talk about that, too, but let me tell you about Nick first. Dr. Nick Morgan is one of America's top communication coaches and thinkers. His clients include leaders of Fortune 50 companies, uh, and he has coached people who to give congressional testimony, to appear on the Today Show, and to take on the investment community. His blog reaches 100,000 readers every month and is syndicated on numerous outlets across the web. He appears regularly on CNN as an expert commentator and is a frequent guest uh, contributor to hbr.org. His most recent book is Can You Hear Me? How to Connect with People in a Virtual World. His acclaimed previous books on public speaking and communication include Give Your Speech, Change the World, How to Move Your Audience to Action, and Power Cues, The Subtle Science of Leading Groups, Persuading Others, and Maximizing Your Personal Impact, as well as Trust Me, Four steps to authenticity and charisma. Nick, it's been a long time. We decided it's been a long time since we saw each other. Welcome. Glad to have you here. Kevin, it's great to connect with you again, and, and I'm looking forward to this conversation. So thanks for arranging this. Uh, you're welcome, and I'm excited about this new book. We're going to get to that in a few minutes. But before we get to the book, I'd like you to tell, tell us a little bit, sort of how did you end up in this game? How did you become one of America's top communication coaches? Sort of what's a little bit about your journey? I think people are always interested to, you know, the people that they're going to listen to, sort of how they got where they are. So can you give us a little bit of the path that got you here? Yeah, two quick stories. Uh, first of all, when I was 17, I, uh, I fractured my skull in a tobogganing accident, and I was in a coma for a week. When I woke up from that coma, I couldn't do something that everybody else, you included, can do automatically and without thinking, which is I couldn't read the body language of people that I knew well, friends and, and family, um, in that way that you, we all do automatically, as I say, uh, we can tell when they're angry or bored or upset just because we're familiar with their expressions and gestures and all that sort of thing. Suddenly I couldn't do that. Um, and so uh, when I went back to school after a few weeks of recovery uh, and my friends came up to me, remember these are 17 year olds and there I am, I'm all white, I've got this terrific scar running down the side of my head. I've got a bandage on. I look terrible. And, and, and they say, uh, Nick, how are you? You look great. And I said, thanks, because I thought they were being serious. I couldn't read the irony, literally, the sarcasm. And so my first interest in body language came from trying to retrain myself to be able to avoid being made fun of by my 17-year-old compadres. All of us have been 17 and have dealt with that, although not with the, with a catastrophic situation. So, yeah. so did you literally have to retrain yourself or did some of that function come back? It, it was a combination over a period of, of about eight months uh, of just, first of all, staring at my friends and thinking now they're smiling or they're rolling their eyes or they're doing whatever they're doing. And that means X. And, and so I had to literally make that connection. And then over time, it gradually came back as no doubt my brain healed from its, uh, its uh, catastrophic accident. Yeah. Everybody wanted to know. So you said two stories. That's the first story. What's the second story? So the, the second story, I'm, uh, I'm an assi assistant vice president and provost at the University of Virginia. And, and so I'm an academic administrator. And, and between you and me, I'm a little bored at this point. I've been doing it for a couple of years. I'm teaching on the side. I'm teaching public speaking. And that's really what I love to do. 
Uh, but I got a call from a friend of mine who had moved on to bigger and better things. He was the assistant, uh, sorry, he was the secretary of education for the governor of Virginia. And he said, Morgan, how would you like to put that academic BS of yours into practice? He knew me and he knew I liked to challenge. Uh, and, and without thinking, I said, sure, what's the, what's the practice? And he said, well, the, the speechwriter for the governor of Virginia has had a nervous breakdown uh, and he needs to be replaced. Clue number one, by the way. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, exactly. He needs to be replaced on short notice. Can you do that? And and I said, sure, thinking the test, put the BS into practice. And what I should have asked, as you immediately picked up on, is clue number one there. Why did he have a nervous breakdown? What was going on? Uh, and I was uh, uh, a little slow to pick up on that. But after I had been on the job for a few months, I understood full well why he had a nervous breakdown. It was overwork. I <laughs> I worked seven days a week, literally, for two years, the remaining two years of the, uh, of the governor's administration, on average five speeches a day, and I uh, uh, was exhausted. I had, I had one day off in two years, uh, one day out of, I'm talking seven days a week now, and that was Christmas Day, and there I was having lunch uh, with, with my extended family. Uh, and but you still uh, had, thankfully. Uh, unbelievably, yeah, and, and <laughs> they called. Uh, the chief of staff called and said, Morgan, get your butt down here. We're, we're getting to work on a speech. And I said, it's Christmas Day. I warned you I was taking this day off. Come on, give me a break. And he said, no, no, we need you down here. And then I played my trump card. I said, I've had a couple of glasses of wine. You know you can't drive legally, in, even in Virginia, uh, with a couple of glasses. So I thought I was safe. Uh, and he said, don't worry. I'm sending two state police cars to pick you up. And sure enough, about 20 minutes later, flashing lights and all, these two police cars show up. And to this day, my good old buddies, friends down in Virginia that I stay in touch with, still think I was arrested on Christmas Day. Nothing I can say will convince them otherwise. Ever can, no, no body language can solve that one, Nick. No, that's right. That's it. They go, yeah, yeah, sure. You were arrested. What was the crime? Come on, tell us. <laughs> <laughs> that's awesome. Well, you know, um, I got... Uh, you, you your, the, your PR folks are doing their job because I got a copy of this. The book that I have is the, the book is now out, but I have this little red thing here. It says advanced reader copy. And as it turns out, the co-author of my new book, Wayne Tremell, also got one. And uh, it's interesting because your new book, again, Can You Hear Me? How to Connect with People in a Virtual World is a great companion to our new book, The Long Distance Leader. Because in oh, both great. cases, we're talking, at least in part, your book is all about that communication at a distance or virtually. Our book, of course, has a piece of that. And so uh, I'm really excited, not only because we get the chance to chat, but because of the connection between the two books. So what led you to take this path and write this book? Well, I, I speak about body language uh, all the time. Um, it's my, my favorite topic. And what I noticed, especially over the last few years, more and more urgently, the question I would get after I'd finished the speech and we get into the Q&A uh, was the following. Somebody would say, this body language stuff's all very interesting and fascinating. Thanks for that. <laughs> uh, but my it's team, always the but. There's always the but, yeah. And, and I, got to, I could see it coming a mile away after a while because I got asked this question over and over again. But... My team is based in Singapore and California and India. Um, you tell me this body language is important for human connection. How do I do that virtually? What's, what's missing? What's there? What's not there? And it was answering that question just because I got asked it over and over again that um, I started to uh, do the research. And I found out, uh, as the book indicates, that it was much, much worse than, than I thought um, because I'm a... Uh, and this is probably important for your viewers and listeners to know. Uh, you know, I'm a I'm a technophile. I'm I'm an early ad adapter. I love uh, technology. I love the iPhone. I've loved all the uh, products, uh, and so I was I was keen on the advantages of virtual communication. I love the idea that the two big advantages are are reduction in friction, as they call it, meaning it's much easier to send emails than it is to uh, write a letter, lick a stamp put it in an envelope, address it, take it down to the post office. I mean, you and I are old enough to remember those days, right? And Hey, I and, have uh, mail right here. Just say it. Uh, there you go, yeah. Uh, and, and, then, and then, of course, the cost is much, much lower. You know, it's, uh, it's essentially free to send out one or a thousand or a million emails. So as we all know to our cost uh, because of spam. So 
um, those two great advantages, just to take the email example, mean that uh, the, that virtual communications has swept the business world, um, and it accelerated hugely this sort of transition to a half real, if you, if we can call it that, half virtual world um, with the cell phone and the, and the introduction of the iPhone ten years ago. Um, that was the huge acceleration, and so we we live in this half virtual, half face-to-face -face world now. And I just started uh, studying, thanks for the question, what does it mean? And how is it working out for us? And it's astonishing. It's not working very well. And it is not working very well, is it? Yeah. I mean, the, there are a couple of stats that really sort of bring this to life. Um, and then we can trade some stories. Uh, uh, my first one, and the most alarming one, perhaps, is uh, studying in the cohort of teenage girls. Uh, we suspect data is similar in other cohorts, uh, and there's some data that indicates that's the case. But uh, this cohort's been studied the, the most closely. We have the best information on it. But there's a direct straight line relationship between the number of hours a teenage girl spends on her cell phone and the likelihood that she's depressed and then uh, really tragically suicidal. Um, and so that line just goes straight up. Uh, and, and then the other, and, and if that isn't shocking enough, the other stat uh, is that um, the familiar one, to many people, the Gallup study that shows that roughly two thirds of your workers in a Fortune 1000 company are disengaged. Two thirds. I mean, and, and the number, that's the United States, the number is higher, it's closer to 80% worldwide. And when you think about that, you ask yourself, how could we have gotten to this epidemic of disengagement? What's going on there? Um, and did that always used to be the case? And, and why has it gotten worse now? Because it, it, it has uh, gotten worse in the last decade or so. Um, and, and so it was studying all that that, uh, and that got me started on this uh, interesting journey. Well, and so that, you know, I mean, we could, we could trade that. Yeah, here's the other thing about the email, and I'm going to come back to email a little later because I want to get yeah. very tactical for people. Um, but it, it's not just that we've moved to email uh, from other written communications, but we've become a much more written focused uh, culture, right? In right. terms of at work. So, you know, we used to go down the hall, we used to pick up the phone, we don't do either one now. Yeah. And, you know, so the issue of uh, people send an email instead of talking to people isn't just when they are in, you know, Mumbai versus, you know, right. that, down, down the hall, uh, because we're not doing it then either in many cases, right, wrong, or indifferent. So, um, one of the, you, you talked about the studies and related to depression and all that stuff. One of the things that you talk about in the book is um, isolation and that we continue, people continue to feel more and more isolated. I actually have uh, another episode that I've already recorded, but for everyone listening, we're going to talk about more about that in a couple of weeks. Um, but I'm curious, talk to me a little bit more about why, why, why this sense of isolation? I think this is especially important for us as leaders of remote teams because we got folks that are out there um, that aren't, don't have the social interaction of coming to the office. So talk a little bit more about what you've learned, excuse me, about the whole isolation piece of this. Yeah, so the big problem uh, requires understanding just a tiny bit about the human brain. Um, we, can, we can sketch that out very quickly, oh, <laughs> which is uh, imagine we evolved in the uh, great savannas of Africa, which is where they say the story began, the human story began. And, 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 and so we're walking through the tall grass there and, and we're actually a pretty frail species when you compare yourself to the apex predators, as they call them, the uh, lions and the tigers. One swipe of the paw from a lion, and we're somebody's lunch meat, right? So this is not a good situation. And so our brains evolved to become prediction machines. And by prediction, I mean just looking a few seconds into the future, looking out for that shadow, which means there's a paw coming at me. Uh, yeah, and, and so I, I duck um, and, uh, our, and get out of the way instinctively or unconsciously to be accurate. And that uh, mechanism is how our brains work uh, and, and what they're essentially there for. All right, so to do that, the brain has to get um, data in through the five senses and another one, uh, preoperception, that's, that let's call it the sixth sense yep. that, we need, that we need to talk about is really important. Um, but um, the brain is this multi-channel 
data machine. So it's taking data in from the five and six and senses and whatnot in order to be able to make those predictions in order to get us out of the way of danger. Right? Yep. Now, um, when th we don't get that information into those channels, um, we have to, the brain doesn't like that. And so what it does is it fills those channels with made up information, essentially. It goes to its memory banks, it makes stuff up, and typically, and it's in the, and this is the interesting part, it's in the brain's interest to fill those empty channels with negative information because a negative bias is more likely to keep us alive. Just in case. Just in case, exactly. So, uh, so if I'm sitting, and, and this is the case of the, uh, of the isolated worker today, because the, uh, the uh, technical channels don't fill us in the same way that a simple face-to-face -face conversation fills us. We don't get the human interaction, the emotions, the underpinnings of what makes human interaction work. So those channels are empty. We fill it up with negative information. And so we assume that that email is hostile. We assume that silence on the audio conference means that people are bored with us or angry at us. Or, you know, we don't just assume that silence implies bliss. You know, they're off somewhere having- Or that they're thinking or whatever. Or, or anything. Yeah, we assume negative. Uh, uh, I always say that when people don't know they make it up and what they make up is negative, right? Exactly. And that's exactly why, because it's actually uh, an evolutionary benefit to assume the worst. Uh, and uh, tragically, I mean, that leads to all kinds of weird online behaviors. Um, and it's a little more complicated than this, but basically that's why we get trolling and things like that, because uh, people have a uh, much less of an emotional connection. Uh, you would never troll somebody in quite the way that people do face to face, or at least most of us wouldn't. Most of, uh, most, the, most of the number of people that do wouldn't, right? There yeah. would be, there are a few, there's always yeah. somebody. Yeah, um, they're crazies out there. And, and the internet smoked them all out, you know, hooray. But uh, uh, most of us wouldn't do that. But online, because the, the human connection is so much more um, minimal and tangential and fragile and weak, um, then we feel free to make up the information in advance that those people are hostile and negative. So we might as well be hostile back at them before it's even happened because uh, we're self-protecting. We're uh, self-protecting and we're preempting, right? We might yeah, as well go first. We're preempting, um, yeah. Early in the book, you say something. It's actually in every chapter has a summary, which is great for a reader. Um, and, and I believe it's the first chapter. You, you make this statement in the summary. It says, most of our communication is unconscious and based on emotion. So I think it's a, you know, we're sort of getting at all of that here in the conversation we've had so far, but talk about the fact that communication is an emotional exchange and how that further complicates the challenges when we're doing it virtually or at a distance. Yeah, so the simplest way to understand this is to, is to think about uh, the, the proverbial two-year-old kid who wanders into the kitchen and uh, puts his finger on that attractive, glowing uh, little orange thing, um, the, the hot stove, um, and is suddenly shocked, furious, because his world has been disrupted in an unexpected and horrible and painful way. What happens with that? Well, you attach a whole lot of emotion to that little incident, and you never put your finger on the hot stove again. That's the way the human mind works. That's essentially how we create connections and scenarios and little stories we tell ourselves to make sense of the world. And remember, again, as we said, it's the important thing is to be able to predict negative events before they happen so we can avoid them. And so when they, when they happen, we attach a lot of emotion to them. So our minds work in terms of attaching emotion to, uh, uh, to events that happen to us, to scenarios. And then we're constantly predicting, does this look like that thing that happened to me before? And is it likely to hurt? And if it's likely to hurt, I'm going to do my best to avoid it. So that's roughly what our brains are doing. It's pretty simple. Now, understand that's being undertaken by the unconscious mind. And so the unconscious mind is busy out there looking for these danger scenarios and predicting. Them. That's how uh, memory and that's how emotion plays into um, this scenario. Uh, because the, uh, the emotions, the stronger the emotion, the more likely we are to remember it. That's the basic uh, idea. Um, and in the online world, you take out most of that emotion or you make it much, much harder to get. And as a result, uh, we're bored with it. We have a hard time um, connecting with things online. And again, we fill with 
uh, negative memories and associations. So we make it out much worse uh, to be much worse than it may actually be. And so that whole phenomena creates this kind of negative miasma that we wallow in in the technological world. And, and as I say, I'm a technophile. I, I love technology. And, and so I, like everybody else, took advantage of it until I started to realize just what the, uh, the problems were. And, and as I say in the book, we need to start a new conversation in many ways uh, in order to, uh, to overcome this. Yeah, in the book, you, you really, uh, I think, are talking about two things. I think a lot of people listening here are probably thinking about the connections to all of this, to us as uh, at work, right, as leaders, as a part of a remote team and all those things. And, and everything you talk about in the book is completely um, connected to all of those thoughts. And, of course, that's sort of what we're talking about here. But your book does have a broader picture, right, that sort of says we need to be creating a new conversation, not just at work, um, in our families, uh, in the in society about how we deal with some of this stuff. And, uh, and you, you yes. share some really interesting tactics that I think will, people will find interesting and helpful. Before we get there, hmm. um, the first half of the book is really sort of the five things we sent, tend to lose in virtual communication. Hmm. Uh, so can you talk about those just briefly and maybe we'll dive into one or two, but, but sort of sure. what, are the, what are the big things that we're losing? Uh, I don't think any of these will probably surprise people, but they probably right. haven't thought about them in quite the way you're going to share it. So you do that real quick. Yeah, exactly. So the first one is the lack of feedback. As we say, you're not getting the, uh, the uh, feedback that we're used to getting. And so we fill up uh, that, those empty channels. Uh, and I mentioned one in particular, uh, uh, prio perception, which is an important one. That we spend a huge amount of time, uh, unconscious mental time, tracking our relationship in space, uh, where we are literally in space, and where everybody who's around us is in space. Um, and that's something we care a lot about, again, for obvious survival reasons. And that's why, for example, and just quickly, we find um, a cocktail party so tiring, <laughs> because typically there are a lot of people milling around us and going in sort of random directions. Um, a lot of them are behind us and just in sort of our peripheral vision. And so we're busy tracking all those people, where they are at all times, because it affects our safety. Uh, and so after an hour of that, you're exhausted because your brain's just been working really, really hard. But uh, the idea is that, again, that because there's this lack of feedback, uh, of the way in which we're used to getting feedback um, in terms of the five senses and then the sixth one that I mentioned, then we fill it. With, uh, with typically with negative information. All right, so the second one then is uh, that uh, as a result, we lack empathy with other human beings because we're not getting feedback uh, that we like to get about how the world around us is working and how other people are. Then we get less feedback and this is what, as we said earlier, leads to trolling. Um, yeah, we don't have a clue. We don't have any cues about how, how they're feeling or what's going on with them, right? So yeah. it's harder to even have it if we want it. That's right. So we, we assume unwisely and, and uncor uncorrectly that, you know, the mean thing we say doesn't hurt them because we don't see the hurt in their eyes. I mean, it's a, really as simple as that. We don't see the wince. We don't see the recoil. Um, and, and those are the th cues that normally uh, help nice, sensitive people like you and I, Kevin, uh, to realize that we've hurt somebody's feelings, right? Uh, yeah, never exactly. mind the, Never mind those other insensitive people that wouldn't get the clue anyway. Exactly. You know, and, We're and so self-aware and, exactly. and, 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 you know, and evolved. Nick. Exactly. Yeah. Evolved humans yeah, only need apply. Uh, and then the third one is the lack of control of the information that's out there about you online. And, and, and the, the sort of classic joke about this one is, is the, the, the recent graduate who goes to apply for the job and discovers the uh, job interviewer looking at uh, his or her drunken uh, frat boy or frat girl. Beer pong or, games or whatever. Yeah, right. right online on Facebook that seemed so clever at the time and now you wish they weren't there. It's, it, it, it's about, you, you create a, a digital footprint out there, whether you are aware of it or not. Um, and, and your lack of control of that is both uh, frustrating for you, but also means that you're turning it over to a machine. The machines never forget. I mean, that's what they're there for. Um, and so uh, that creates a, a huge problem sort of in the way it, it, it's as if we uh, were like, ocean liners that create this huge wake that hits the world before we even get there, sort of, and have a chance uh, you know, to... One of the tools that you talk about in the book, and one of the tools that we use here at the Kevin Eikenberg Group is Slack. 
and um, mm-hmm. and, and Slack is a you know, is a very helpful to us. Help helped us a lot. Helps a lot of other organizations. But but I you know I th- I don't want people to leave that that point about lack of control, thinking oh well that's for those young that's for those young kids and those issues, or that's for my kids, uh, because I think even in something like Slack inside of your organization, how you choose to interact there is creating a persona that others are seeing. And it may not be as drastic as the drunken frat party right. scenario, but it's the, the same thing is true. So all I'm really saying to everyone listening is don't, don't sort of poo poo that one and say, okay, I get that one, Nick, go on to the next one. Right. Because I think there's something there for all of us to think about. And for us as leaders to think about in creating the culture that we want in an organization, how we're going to use those kinds of tools inside of our teams. Yeah, exactly. Think about just the sheer number of emails you send every day and, and how many of them are just kind of done on the fly because we have too many emails. I mean, that's one of the results of the, the unintended consequences of the success of email and the ease of email is that we, we, we get way too many of them. We respond to way too many of them and we respond quickly and thoughtlessly. We do it on the fly. We do it while we're doing something else. We do it while we're on an audio conference. And as a result, all no, no. Goes, no, 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 we're not doing that, Nick. Put yeah. your phone away, buddy. <laughs> yeah, put your phone away. Not anymore. Yeah. Uh, <laughs> but uh, as a result, you know, there's, as you say, there's this long record out there, this persona that, and people get, oh, that's, that's Kevin doing that again, uh, you know, or that's Nick doing that yeah, again. Right? Exactly. Um, so we've talked about the loss of feedback and the loss of empathy and the loss of sense of control. Of a, yeah, two more. What else? Two more. Yeah. So the, uh, the, this lack of an emotional subtext um, that normally controls, as I said earlier, how we make decisions means that we lacking that emotional uh, investment in the conversation uh, means it's very difficult. And, and this is especially for leaders who are, are trying to manage teams that are virtual teams. It's very difficult to make good decisions because decisions are made based on our emotional uh, connection to them. In other words, uh, and, and you do this automatically when it's face to face. You're sitting around the team and you've got this great new idea and you're saying, team, let's get behind this. And you see half the team roll its eyes and the other half the team, yeah, exactly, as you suggest, fold its arms. Well, you know you've got some selling to do at the very least. And maybe you give up on the idea, maybe you don't, but you know that there's some work to do. You get none of that on the uh, on the audio conference. You assume silence implies consent. Uh, half the people are on mute doing something else. And as a result, um, you don't get that feedback. So that's a simple example. But throughout the uh, um, the uh, uh, virtual world, we have this issue of poor decision making as a result of the fallout of, the, of this lack of, uh, of emotional subtext. So we don't know what's at stake is the simple way to put it. And so we make crappy decisions about it. And then the, and we the tend fi- to think we need to make them faster, I think, too, which is connected. It's, it's a separate idea, but it's connected that, oh, you know, we think we need to because we can. We yes. just send them a note and decision made. And I, I, you're exactly right. Yeah. And a simple solution, a simple example is it used to be, and I, I mentioned this in the book, it used to be a couple of years ago. Um, it was OK to reply to an email in a day or two, and it was still considered polite. And now I've noticed if I don't reply to an email in a few hours, it's certainly within 24 I'll get a follow-up email from somebody who's saying, what happened? Have you died? Uh, you know, where are you, Nick? Come on, come on. Respond, respond. You know, and, and as a result, I feel like I have to speed up my decision-making and, and to the point it's not going to be as good if I'm just sort of rushing just to, just to keep up the whole day. Mm-hmm. Uh, and then the, so the last one really for me in a way is the sort of most profound, the fallout of these, and it's kind of the accumulation of all of them, is then the lack of of connection, of human connection, and therefore commitment. And what happens is uh, most of our relationships online are fragile. Now, um, and, and let's just talk about uh, our relationship here just for a, sec- a second, uh, because it illuminates it. So you and I first met in person, and and uh, we had a nice time together at that at that great conference, and, and we learned, talk about technophiles, we learned a lot about uh, Twitter and things like that. Uh, I'll never forget long, that. It was a long time ago. It was a long time ago, everybody. Um, but that, but that uh, connection gives us a basis upon which to base this uh, virtual connection um, sure. and to keep it alive. And one of the reasons why every time I see the name uh, Kevin Eikenberry, I get this nice warm feeling is because we had that connection, uh, that face-to-face connection uh, years ago. Whereas, whereas now, um, if if I've got virtual connections, they're just much more fragile. Um, and 
the example I like to use here is uh, compare Amazon.com to, and this is just a retail example to keep it simple, Amazon.com to any other online place you might have shopped. Um, Amazon works amazingly hard to make it easy for you uh, to buy, and it makes it easy for you as possibly again one-click shopping, return stuff if you need. It's, all of that is easy, easy, easy. They don't want to do anything to make that harder because they understand the fragility of that connection. But think about some other uh, online thing, uh, and I don't want to take on it. Doesn't on matter, a, right? It doesn't matter. But you all but, have an experience where it wasn't so easy, and right. your feeling about it is very different. Yeah. What do you do? You go away and you never come back. And that's basically the online issue. The, the connections, the human connections are much more fragile, uh, much more transitory. And, and that's the world we're living in. And, and yet we assume, because we're still operating in essentially the same way, that that online connection is kind of like our personal connections. And so we're hurt, we're offended, we're surprised when somebody blows us off and says, okay, that's it. Uh, and I, I use the example in that chapter of... Uh, uh, somebody had made a, a mutual uh, introduction to a potential client for me. Um, and we were going to connect on Skype or Zoom as we, as we are now. And I, that, I had written it down. I'd gotten the wrong time in the uh, – it was just my bad. I'd gotten the wrong time in the calendar. I was like half hour off or something like that. Um, and, and I was having a bad day. And, and uh, the technology wasn't working really well. All right. Now, it was still me. I'm still the same charming guy that I thought I was. But think about it from the other person's point of view. Very different. Barely hear me, see me. It wasn't working very well. I was late. I was flustered. He just decided not to bother. And in thinking about it in retrospect, that's the nature of that kind of online conversation. Whereas had it been in person, I could have come rushing in half an hour late or Maybe I would have got the word and come in 20 minutes late, right? I could have apologized profusely, could have bought him a cup of coffee. There are all kinds of ways face-to-face -face where we can kind of make up for that and say, I'm not that person. This was just an off day. But online, you don't get that message. It's, that's the guy. That's who he is, okay? And if he's that much work, I'm not going to bother. And not only that, but so, you know, thankfully, you have this warm, fuzzy feeling about me when you hear my name. Now, that, that person forever, yeah. at least for a long time is going to have a different sort of connection to your name. It's not what we want. And, that's right. and, and, and it's just the nature of this living half in reality and half in this virtual world that's, that's causing some of those challenges. So exactly. I know, uh, Nick, that we could talk for a long time. There's a lot of other stuff that I wanted us to chat about. But I do want to, before we go, you talk about some stuff in the book about email. We've talked a lot about email. Um, first, I want to make an observation. Uh, and that is that, you know, when we started, you asked, hey, are we going to, or is the video just for you and I, or is the video to be, to be out in the world. And of course, if you're listening, you can go to remarkablepodcast.com and you can watch us. But note that there have been several times in this conversation, if you're just listening, that you could tell that we could see each other because the body language allowed us to communicate more successfully, knowing hopefully not to interrupt, when to say something, I would do something. And Nick goes, yeah, that, you get what I'm saying. And, and so the, the whole idea of using, just the simple idea of using your webcam as a way to make some of these things get better, I, I think you would agree with me, like turn them on and use them more often, yes? Yeah, absolutely. The, the thing to know is that it's, it's much improved over a phone call um, and way improved over email. Um, it's still not the same as being there. And there's a long technological explanation in the book about why uh, that's the case. We don't have time to get into that now, but, uh, but just, just uh, your uh, listeners and viewers should understand, it still is different. It's basically a two-dimensional representation of a three-dimensional space. Um, and as a result, the brain is still working harder than it is uh, in face-to-face. -face. Uh, but uh, as I say, it's much improved over the, uh, over, over the alternative. So let's all hope for the day when, when this is just the absolute norm. So the old commercial, and I don't remember who it was for, said that it's the next best thing to being there. Uh, and I would say that it is the next best thing to being right. here, being there. Um, so, but I do want to give you a couple minutes to talk about email. Everyone wants to know about email. And you, you, make, some, you make some points uh, about how to use email that I think some people might disagree with or find interesting. So what are a couple of maybe the more, you would say, more controversial or more interesting suggestions you have about how people can use email better? 
Well, I started studying email and I ran across a study that said that um, if you use email, if, if you use, sorry, emoticons and emojis in business email, then it looks like you're less professional. So the association in run-ups minds is still that that's kind of things that kids do in texting and that kind of thing. However, I would come out strongly against that. I would say emoticons precisely start to put back in the emotions that are lacking in an email. If you and I were as good as Shakespeare, um, then presumably we could convey amazing emotions in our writing uh, and we could do it on the fly. We could do it as we said earlier, even though we're overloaded and responding too fast and not thinking enough, uh, but we can't. Uh, and so we're gonna get it wrong and we're not gonna be clear about what our emotions are. Emojis, emoticons are a, are a nice quick way to put a smile on, on the end of that communication to say, if this sounded a little harsh, I didn't mean it, it, which is easy to do in person, hard to do in email. So that would be the first thing I'd say. Everybody I was needs, hoping you'd say that one because yeah. I actually agree with you. I mean, we don't need to start putting like little uh, cactus emoticons in our emails or whatever we could come up with those. But, but the things that help convey our feelings or our facial expression, I'm right with you 100%. So I'm glad that's one of them that you picked. Yeah, and, and understand, I agree with you about the cactus. Like, don't get too subtle here. Keep it to smiley faces, uh, to anger when anger is the emotion you want to convey, to sorrow, you know, the... the the little tear when that's the one you want to convey, just because you want to clue people into so basically what's your orientation here. Um, and then the, the other one that I would say is, uh, which I recommend strongly to people to use on audio conferences and even on video conferences is, and you can use this uh, in the text form as well, is to say, how did what I just wrote you make you feel? And the important thing about that is that it creates the space then of respect for you to respond and say, okay, this is how I felt. And we don't take time to do that in our rushed modern era. And, and again, back to the, just the sheer load of emails that we have, you know, we type a, a one sentence comment, uh, a couple of words uh, that hurts somebody's feelings and we never ask. And so we don't find out and they, they smolder with resentment and we don't find out till later on that that's the case. So if we get into the habit of, especially when we're talking about substantive emails. Yep. If we get in the habit of, and, and phone calls the same way, saying, how did what I just wrote or how did what I just say make you feel? Then I think that's the beginning of the conversation that we need to get into the habit of having in the, in the virtual world because that's, that's conveyed automatically face-to-face -face, um, and, as we've said, to a certain extent in the video uh, world, but not, not in audio text. and not in text, not at all in text. In fact, it's usually the other way around. Usually it's misunderstood in text. And, and that little bit of wit and sarcasm that you think is so clever um, just for some reason is missed by your stupid uh, uh, recipients. You know, how could they misunderstand? How could they not? I mean, I told them, how can they not know? It's exactly. like somehow we forget the fact that the receiver uh, is making the call here. It's not our, just, it's, they're making the call, right? Exactly. Um, so, so Nick, the, the next section of our, uh, our program is called the fast break. And the fast break is brought to you all by the Long Distance Leader, our new book, uh, which helps you think about leading a team that's remote and the nuances to do that. And you can learn more and get a sample chapter by going to longdistanceleaderbook.com. Now, Nick, the fast break, I've got three words for you. Now, I have to say, as I thought about them afterwards, I'm, I'm giving you softballs. Not everyone gets softballs, just so you know. Yeah, Thank you. Take it for what it is. Yeah. Um, so, but I've got three words for you, and I, I'm just going to say the word. I just want you to sort of, what is your whatever you want to say briefly, your thoughts about that idea. Are you ready? Yeah. Okay, the first one is communication. Uh, communication is the essence of leadership in my mind. It's, it's the job of every leader uh, to uh, make it their art, their practice uh, for the rest of their leadership days. Uh, without communication, um, without communicating well, uh, then, the problems just begin and, and snowball and, and will never get, uh, never get cured. It's your job to convey what it is you need from that team, what it is you expect that team to do together um, that they can't do alone. Uh, and it's your job to keep them tied uh, emotionally together as well. So communication is everything in my mind, but you knew I'd say that. I, well, see, I told you, softball. Yeah, uh, next, awesome. one is, next one is authenticity. Yeah, authenticity is is the the uh, the uh, water we swim in now. Um, it, it didn't used to be that way uh, uh, 
but uh, it's it's a result of a whole host of factors like uh, the virtual world, like 24-7 communication, like YouTube uh, videos, gotcha videos. Uh, I mean, the leader who thinks that he or she can get away with being inauthentic now just doesn't understand the world that we live in. Um, and somewhere along the line, we got marketed to to death, and I'm not quite sure when that happened. And I've seen studies that say we get anywhere from 5,000 to 15,000 marketing messages a day. Um, and and so we got we got very very good at kind of discounting the BS in that. And what we crave now is authenticity. And and so it's sort of table stakes. Uh, if you don't, if you're not willing to be authentic with your team, uh, with the people around you, then you're just you're not going to get started with them. Basically, they're going to tune you out very quickly. And the last one is charisma. Yeah, charisma is one of my favorite subjects. So thanks for softballing me on that one. That's yeah, I told you. One. Yeah. Um, so uh, people think charisma is something that movie stars have and the rest of us don't, or maybe a few politicians have and the rest of us don't. It's kind of fairy dust that's sprinkled on some people and not others. It's a matter of luck or genetics or who knows what. But it's not. Charisma is focused emotion. And we, we are all charismatic. You were charismatic when you were six years old um, and you came home from school and you'd gotten some prize in school or something cool had happened. And you came home and you said, mommy, daddy, this happened. And you're all excited. And they knew instantly that that's how you were feeling. And you were just radiating that enthusiasm and energy. Think of that, that child in you and how you felt where that emotion just completely consumed you. You were charismatic in that moment. And we can train ourselves to be charismatic again as grownups by allowing a strong emotion to infuse us and to focus. Most of us go around every day with a, a to-do list in our head. We're distracted. We got all kinds of stuff on our mind. And it's gotten much worse in the virtual world that we were talking about. And as a result, we're not focused. <clears throat> Excuse me. We don't have a strong emotion. So clear that clutter away, get a strong emotion, and you can be charismatic. All right. So you can thank me later for me giving you easy ones today on that. Uh, and so, mail, so Nick, what is something when you're not uh, coaching uh, communicators, when you're not communicating, writing about communication, writing books, what do you do for fun? Uh, what I do for fun? Uh, I'm a musician, an amateur musician. So I play piano um, and uh, I play uh, classic guitar. Uh, and I started classic guitar as a kid thinking that I would be able to uh, get dates. and Yeah, and, I was going to say, this is about getting a girl. It wasn't about and, the guitar. And somebody fooled me because it's actually rock and roll that gets all the girls and, and, and the dates and things. It's not classic guitar. That turned out to be uh, wrong. I was just wrong about that. But I ended up loving the classic guitar. So uh, I, that's the other thing I do. All right. And so what, uh, as we get ready to wrap up here, uh, what uh, is it that you are reading or have read recently that people might find interesting? Yes, it's that book called The 12 Rules for, for Life or 12 Rules for Living um, uh, by the Canadian author. Uh, the rules themselves are not surprising. Peterson is the, is the author's name. Um, the rules themselves are not that surprising. It's variations on the golden rule and, and the sort of basic simple rules from our Judeo-Christian heritage that would not surprise you. Um, and, and in fact, all the, the, the big major religions share these rules. Mm -hmm. um, but uh, what's, what's powerful about the book is the write-up, the, the depth that he goes into in the chapter that leads up to the rule. And by the time you get done reading that chapter, you sort of understand the issues of, of good and evil and how humans wrestle with them. And, and the fact that we all are on this planet doing our best as humans to try to make a better world and failing uh, so often and and what that means and how we can do better. It's a powerful, powerful book. Not, as I say, for the rules, which are uh, will not surprise you, but it's worth getting into the, the write-ups uh, because I found those very, very powerful. All right, well, thank you for that. So last question, the one you've been dying, Nick, for me to actually ask is, uh, we've been talking about your new book, Can You Hear Me? How to Connect with People in a Virtual World. How can people find out about the book, learn more about you and your work? How do they get a hold of you? Uh, thank you for that question. Uh, publicwords.com is our website. If you go to that, there's a contact information. I'm easy to get to, nick at publicwords.com, or just fill out the contact form. There's lots of information about the book on there uh, and lots of free information about my passion, which is uh, communications. I've been blogging 
uh, since even before I met you, Kevin. Yeah, I have been too, both of us, a long, long time. That's yeah, right. yeah. And exactly. as a result, there's this huge uh, database, data bank, which, you can, which is fully searchable of information about public speaking and communications and body language and all those juicy topics. So awesome. publicwords.com. Publicwords.com, everyone. Yeah. And so before you go, everybody, the question now for you is, now what? What action are you going to take? What insight, other than, of course, buying a copy of the book, what insights did you gather, but what action will you take? Maybe it's about one of those things that we talked about about loss. Maybe it's one of the ideas that we talked about around email. Maybe it's you got an idea about someone that you want to connect with differently or more fully now as it relates to our conversation. So our challenge to you, both of ours, is that you take some action on what you just learned because without the action, sort of what was the point? So Nick, thank you so much for being here. I was looking forward to, ever since I got the book, I've been looking forward to us having this conversation. It was an excuse for us to reconnect. Kevin, it was great. It was good to see you again and, and great to connect. I'm glad you uh, uh, went the extra step and did the video connection because it is much more powerful than just uh, just audio. So thanks for that. You're very welcome. And everybody, we're here every week. If you like this one, come on back. we got some great guests coming up in the next few weeks. I'm not going to tell you who they are. I promise you, you won't want to miss them. And if you're just getting started with us, there's a whole bank, like 129 others. You can go back and listen. You can binge. Listen to the Remarkable Leadership Podcast. We're here every week. Come on back. We'll see you then. Thanks, everybody.